Good evening. Welcome uh, to the lecture this evening. I'm Wendy Winterstein. I serve as the Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the Director of the Experiment Station. It's such a pleasure to see so many good friends of the college and so many of our students, faculty and staff here tonight. Thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, for the Carl and Marjorie Hertz Lecture on Emerging, emerging Issues in Agriculture. Tonight's speaker is Jim Burrell. He is the Executive Vice President of DuPont and a member of the company's Office of the Chief Executive. He oversees DuPont's production agricultural businesses, DuPont Crop Protection, and Pioneer Hybrid. Jim grew up on a farm near Clarion that included hogs, corn, and soybeans. After earning degrees in agricultural business from Iowa State University, he went to work in sales for DuPont in Ohio in 1978. His career with the company has included sales and management positions in agricultural products, DuPont crop production, excuse me, protection, and human resources. He has worked in the United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan, among other locations. Jim is a member of the ISU Alumni Association, the Cyclone Club, Order of the Knoll, Campaign, Campanile Society, and chair of the National 4-H Council's board. He is a member, uh, board member of Crop Life International and of the Farm Foundation. Jim is known for his optimistic approach to using agricultural science to address society's most pressing issues. Consequently, Jim is a fitting choice to offer the first Carl and Marjorie Hertz lecture on emerging issues in agriculture. This lecture series was created in memory of Carl and Marjorie Hertz, the founders of Hertz Farm Management, to inspire generations of industry leaders, research scientists, young professionals, to help them reach their full potential. Carl Hertz attended Iowa State during the Depression, majoring in animal husbandry. While on campus, he worked in the meat lab for 35 cents an hour, was on the national champion livestock judging team, and was a member of farmhouse fraternity. Marjorie lived and worked with the family of the Dean of Home Economics during her studies at Iowa State University. That had to be intimidating to be living with the Dean. She also worked in the experimental rat laboratory for 25 cents an hour, learning slightly less than Carl at 35 cents an hour. She played the cello in the Iowa State College Symphony and graduated in 1935 with a degree in home economics and nutrition. In 1940, 46, um, I'm unsure of the date now, Carl and Marjorie decided to farm the family farm southeast of Nevada. Carl did agricultural consulting on the side, which led to the founding of Hertz Farm Management. Since then, the company has grown to become one of the largest farm management, real estate, and rural appraisal firms in the United States. We have many members of the Hertz family in attendance tonight, and from the company as well, and I'd like to uh, introduce them to you. Uh, Tom and Joyce Hertz, would you stand as I say your name? Uh, Tom and Joyce, Tom is, the prin is a principal at Hertz Farm Management. Randy and Liz Hertz. Uh, Randy is also a principal at Hertz Farm Management. Kirk Y, who is a personal friend of Jim and Marsha and the Hertz Farm Manager. Uh, Kurt is also the fourth member of the Hertz uh, company that is served as the National American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers president. So the fourth president from the Hertz Farm uh, Management Company. He's a graduate of the Farm Op Program in 1979. Tim Fievel is here, and Tim is a Hertz Farm Manager and manages Ralph Burrell's farm uh, for the family. Uh, Mina Hertz Jacobs is a, a Hertz Farm, Hertz family member uh, with a degree from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences in uh, 1961. And Lloyd Brown is here and Lloyd is the president uh, of Hertz Farm Oxford, Management uh, and graduated with an ag business degree in 1969. 
Also in attendance uh, is Jim's wife, Marcia. Uh, they're already been published on a different site. Thank you. Site and, uh, uh, his father, Ralph. There in, in the public forum. His we'll, sister, we'll Jane, and his brother-in-law, Bill Deppman. So it's a pleasure to welcome the Hertz family, uh, the members of the Hertz business. Uh, please join me in thanking them for the extraordinary gift they get, gave to establish this lecture series. And now, please help me welcome Jim uh, to the podium for his presentation. Thanks, Wendy. Good evening, and uh, you know, let me start by saying how, uh, how honored I am to be here tonight, but also how humbled I am to be in front of this group. Um, you know, the, uh, the Hertz family uh, started, uh, founded a firm that has really perfected the art of managing production agriculture in the Midwest U.S. and, and uh, has contributed in so many ways. Faculty from Iowa State University, uh, the institution that rounded out my book learning, but perhaps more than that, uh, uh, sparked my imagination in finding what could be. Uh, members of Alpha Gamma Rho, the uh, social and professional fraternity that, uh, that helped me understand and really appreciate that through better men we could create a broader and better agriculture. Now there's a college friend or two in the, uh, in the crowd tonight, and uh, we shared so many of those special experiences. Now, You'll have to remember that we agreed that we would not speak of those out loud. <laughs> You've met my sister and my brother-in-law and my dad, the person who, uh, who taught me everything that <clears throat> really matters in life, and my wonderful wife, Marcia, who uh, continues to be so supportive, whether it's defending uh, sustainable agriculture and modern agriculture with her friends and acquaintances who don't really understand what it takes to sustainably feed a growing population, or just being a, uh, a patient an understanding partner when work takes me to the four corners of the world. So I look forward to our dialogue tonight uh, about agriculture and, uh, and about our future together. I want to start with a tale of two villages. It's, uh, it's a short story and one that, uh, that I'll return to in a few minutes, uh, but it's important. Last month with a group of colleagues, I visited two villages in Malawi, a country in southeastern Africa. One village was part of the Millennium Villages project. Uh, it housed the ingredients of agricultural success, modern seeds, uh, adequate fertilizer, uh, uh, a big building that was used as a, uh, for far by farmers to store their seed before planting and their harvest afterward. In this village, farmers learn how to be better farmers with agronomic advice from specialists, with uh, uh, they're able to maximize their production with the ability to store their grain. They're able to uh, decide when to bring their harvest to market, uh, giving them greater control over their own destinies. And not very far away stands another village with people just as capable, with farmers just as eager, but without the same endowments of opportunity. Farming in the traditional methods that have yet to be touched by the Green Revolution uh, or any other tools of modern 21st century agriculture. They barely grow enough food to feed themselves, and uh, much less have any excess to be able to bring to market. Without good storage, they lose between a third and a half of their harvest to pests and environmental problems. They often sell some of their harvest for grain, or for cash, uh, right after harvest, even though they're gonna need to buy some grain back later in the year to feed their families. That is, if they have the cash available to do that, more likely they'll be dependent on food aid or perhaps simply go hungry, locked in a cycle of poverty. In the first village, farmers can grow about five and a half tons of maize or corn per hectare. Before these advancements uh, and the application of fertilizer, these farmers delivered about a half a ton per hectare, which is about what the second village I mentioned continues to harvest today. Now, that's an order of magnitude. That's 10 times the difference, and both of those are far different from the over 10 tons per hectare that we average across the U.S. Jeff, and in that so gap is the difference between global feast and global famine, not just for them, but in many ways for all of us. Because 
These two villages are real places, but in many ways they represent the divergent future that's possible for a world without significant and sustained effort by all of us to produce more food, better food, and to produce it sustainably. The world faces a challenge. Feeding 9 billion people by the year 2050 in sustainable ways with limited land and resources. There are two aspects to this challenge. One is well understood, the other perhaps not so much. The first is that we need agriculture to be more productive, to grow more on every acre of land. We have made tremendous strides over the last uh, few decades, but we're still not moving fast enough. If you take a look at this chart, the current rates of agricultural productivity, if left unchanged, are too slow and too low. As the Global Harvest Initiative's GAP report explicitly states, in order to keep pace with the global population explosion, over the next 40 years, agricultural productivity needs to increase at a rate of about 1.75% per year. The current trend has been about 1.4% over the past few years. So the growth rate has to increase by 25%, 25% faster than the recent trending rate. So we must double production in the next 40 years on basically flat acres in increasingly sustainable ways, and this is the productivity gap. Now, I believe we can meet this goal, but there's a second question, and that is, will the food we grow be able to get to the markets and to the people who really need it? We could live in a world, in other words, where there's a mismatch between the location of the harvest and the location of the people who really need it in agriculturally developed areas, uh, uh, having more food and not enough to meet the needs in developing areas. This graph shows the current population and the agricultural production in the agriculturally developed regions on the left, and the same for the agriculturally developing regions on the right. And when we add to it the production uh, and the population growth we expect between now and 2050, you can see the result. There's enough total food for everyone, but it's not in the right places. And we can't wait until 2050 to find the answer to the challenge. With historically low stocks to use ratios, the, cur the cushion for supply shocks is gone. Production needs to increase in all regions of the world, aligned with demand consistently, and we need to start today. We also must realize that production alone won't solve the problem. To address, to address the gap, we will need infrastructure investment, agricultural development, a host of other uh, drivers that I'll discuss in the next few minutes. This challenge presents, of course, both a threat and an opportunity. On the surface, we have about a billion people today that are going hungry. Add another two billion to that over the next 40 years. And uh, if nothing else, it leaves us with the moral imperative to do everything we can to help them be fed. But if we consider it another way, effectively bringing three billion more people into productive society will be a significant economic driver, leading to more production, more consumption, and more prosperity. For the agriculture industry, that means more seed sales, more crop protection, more U.S. commodity exports. Overall, it means more jobs, more economic growth, more trade. Remember, we're talking about about a 30% increase in population that could drive a significant increase in economic activity around the world if successfully navigated. Agricultural development is foundational. It can drive economic development in developing regions, giving them the power to buy imports. This brings additional demand and incentive for commercial farmers to boost their production. And in fact, there's a tremendous opportunity for the agriculture industry to step up, to innovate, and to help solve one of the biggest challenges that the human race will ever face. Now, I'm not a doomsdayer, but let's imagine for a moment if we're not able to solve the problem, if we don't successfully rise to the challenge. First, it's expected that by 2050, 70% of the world's population will be urban. Three billion hungry people is not just an economics issue, but one of peace and security. One where we can already see evidence of unrest when food is scarce. From 2007 and 2008, the world's supplies tightened as demand grew, causing wheat prices to double and causing prices uh, of other crops to raise as well. Nations responded, 
many applied control, export controls uh, or limited agricultural uh, uh, or price controls that are limited exports. Uh, food, food riots broke out uh, in several areas where food was particularly scarce, such as Mozambique. So high food prices returned this past year. Uh, the World Bank's food price index rose 15% between October 2010 and January of this year. It's 29% above the level it was a year ago, and it's only uh, uh, a few points below its highest point ever in January. Again, governments reacted. Take China, for example. Uh, in November of 2010, the leaders in China faced soaring food prices uh, that threatened an inflationary spiral, already a concern to China's government in an effort to stabilize the exorbitant food prices, which in some cities like Beijing raised, uh, rose over 100% in just a few months. Chinese officials uh, resorted to boosting supplies by, of staple foods by dipping into uh, stockpiles. But in other places, higher prices were part of the impetus for civil unrest, fueling regime, regime change and internal conflict. These sharp global increases in food prices were a key catalyst in starting some of the political unrest in the Middle East and Northern Africa that we recently saw. Indeed, the International Monetary Fund has looked at some 120 countries from 1970 to 2007 and concluded that high agricultural prices directly feed into political unrest. As the IMF authors state, quote, in low-income countries, increases in the international food prices lead to a significant deterioration in democratic institutions and a significant increase in the incidence of anti-government demonstrations, riots, and civil conflict. And of course, there's an economic interest as well. Without economic development, there will be no economic basis for the developing nations to be able to buy the additional food that they'll need. That means the economic incentive for those of us that are trying to, to come up with tools that drive productivity increases won't be there. And it means that the inertia of productivity growth that we see in places uh, like the US could continue while we have gluts of grain here and starving people elsewhere. You know, it wouldn't be a pretty picture for anyone. To make matters more challenging, today we face worldwide arable land shortages coupled with the fact that water is a scarcity for direct human consumption. Uh, one in eight people uh, lacks access to safe drinking water today, let alone for crops. And we need to recognize that 70% of the fresh water in the world today is used for agriculture. So you can see the emerging dilemma. At the same time, we're dealing with environmental factors that are outside of our control. Earlier this year, China faced a widespread crippling drought, the worst such drought in 60 years that threatened the wheat crop for the world's largest wheat producer. And Texas is facing its biggest drought in 44 years, eroding beef and wheat supplies. So this is a challenge that needs to be met head on. So whether it's for altruism or whether it's a belief that we're at one of the most critical junctures of our time, it is economically, environmentally, and socially important that we succeed in meeting the challenge that's before us. And I believe that our agriculture industry can lead the way in partnership with others. We've seen that when we apply innovation to this challenge, we can be successful. Over the past two decades in the US, improvements in corn seed, agronomic practices, crop protection products and traits have increased yields by uh, per acre by 41%. And while dramatically increasing corn's productivity, U.S. farmers have on average decreased their per bushel water use by 27%, soil loss by 69%, energy use by 37%, greenhouse gas emissions by 30%. And these statistics show that we know how to increase productivity while managing resources efficiently. So you can see that there are enormous challenges to helping the world feed itself. No one organization has the answer. In fact, DuPont has assembled an external committee, which I'll discuss a little more later, to look at the issue and to develop recommendations. Look for these insights later in the year. But in the meantime, I'd like to share at least a few thoughts for your consideration. First is that farmers everywhere, large and small, need to succeed. This is an important point that bears repeating. The goal is not that some farmers in one part of the world produce enough to feed everybody around the globe. That won't work. The goal must be that farmers in all parts of the world will succeed. And this is no threat 
to American exports, demand is rising faster than we can supply. And it's not a time for producers to feel competitive or protective. The world is going to need all the food we can produce. Our focus needs to be on productivity and on effectively dealing with the mismatch that I described. And in a world where today more than 75% of food never crosses an international border, exports will need to be an even more important part of the global solution than they are today. We really need to understand the nature of the farms and what's required for farmers to succeed. And as I've traveled around the world, I, I find that the, uh, the fundamental goals of every farmer are essentially the same. To have a successful livelihood, improve the quality of life for themselves and their families, and to achieve that success in a way in which they can take pride. There does seem to be a universal feeling that producing food is noble work, and while their goals are the same, their challenges differ. Today, 70% of the developing world's 1.4 billion extremely poor people live in rural areas, the very place where you would expect food to be plentiful, or at least most available. And according to the FAO, a third of the world's farmers, that's some 450 million people, have not benefited from the agricultural revolution, the green revolution, or even the use of animals to assist in farming. With only manual farming implements, no fertilizer, etc., they barely scrape by through farming. So the statistics are grave, but as I experienced in Malawi, we can see a glimpse of a better future. The first village that I described I called a Millennium Village as part of the effort led by the United Nations and the Earth Institute at Columbia University. The villages are a place where an organized effort is being made to meet each of the eight Millennium Development Goals adopted by the United Nations in 2000. They seek, first, the eradication of extreme poverty and hunger, universal primary education, gender equality and empowerment, reduction of child mortality, better maternal health, success in fighting disease like HIV, AIDS, and malaria, environmental sustainability, and a global partnership for development. That's a big and challenging goal but it also is, at the same time, quite modest in its, in its aspiration because, remember, we live in a nation where we take all eight of those goals for granted. We've visited that village along with DuPont's Advisory Committee for Agricultural Innovation and Productivity for the 21st Century. It's chaired by former Senator Tom Daschle, and among its members is Dr. Pedro Sanchez of Columbia University's Earth Institute. Pedro helped to create the Millennium Villages, and he showed us how much progress has been made with fertilizer made available through governmental efforts, with construction of a new building that allows seed to be stored prior to harvest and, and harvest to be stored until farmers want to bring it to market, with better health care and education, with improved sources of water. And in that village, we met with village chiefs, with school children, with nurses, and the broad focus on education, health, and agriculture is what's lifting the Millennium Village from its poverty. The holistic approach ensuring that every farmer had everything they needed for progress, not just one or two elements. You know, it doesn't work to have better seed and no water. Or to have water but no place to store your harvest. Or to have a harvest but to fall sick for lack of basic health care. The example shows the power of collaboration opposite a unified goal. And I believe that industry, academia, government, NGOs, and producers will need to work together to collaborate in ways like we've never seen before. The promise we saw in that village and the dozen or so millennium villages that exist across the continent demonstrates the potential for progress, but that potential is as yet unfulfilled in most of the developing world. Consider that before the millennium village uh, in Mwandama, Malawi, started, it was a place where nearly 90% of the people lived in extreme poverty, extreme poverty that was actually worse than the nation as a whole. So what we see is tantalizing, but there's a long road from promise to performance. And it's a road that all farmers all over the world have to be able to travel. And to do that, we need a global approach and a concerted effort to knocking down the barriers to agricultural production. For example, farmers need access to the best technology but they also need access to credit and financing. Boosting productivity won't matter if farmers don't have access to roads and infrastructure to move food or access to markets to be able to sell it. And of course, none of this matters if farmers live in a place that doesn't have a strong civil society, the rule of law, or basic land rights. In addition, economic development is critical in developing countries, or in developing countries to create off-farm jobs as productivity increases to be able to create uh, 
employment for urban dwellers and enable them to be able to buy the food imports that will help fill the gap that we described. Agricultural development itself will create economic development, but governments and societies need conscious efforts to quickly build the non-agricultural economies as well. Commercial farmers will play an important role too. As you know, Iowa alone produces 20% of the nation's corn crop and almost 15% of the soybeans. Iowa is the number one exporter of soybeans and feed grains in the U.S. But Iowa farmers also have challenges where we, and when I say we, I mean my company, government, industry, universities, where we collectively need to make a difference. Many are similar to the challenge of commercial farmers that, uh, face, that are facing globally, but I'd highlight two major areas. One is our aging transportation system. If you think about the growth in biofuels in the Midwest, it certainly has improved the basis. Uh, it's helped farm incomes as we were able to establish value-added agriculture. The unintended consequence is the wear and tear on rural roads. This change has resulted in a threefold increase in the truck traffic on rural roads. Historically, farmers would deliver their grain to the local elevator. It would usually then be by, transported by rail, either to a local uh, a domestic location or to the Gulf for export. It might have been taken by truck to a nearby river for barging for export. But today, it's virtually all truck traffic through the multiple of, uh, locations, to the elevator, to a processor, to an ethanol plant. And when you look at current government funding in transportation, it's focused primarily on getting people from one urban area to the other. We've seen the widening of Highway 44, the widening of Highway uh, 20, of Highway 30, all of those to four lane, and that's been a great and a very important improvement. However, it also means that funding isn't necessarily going to the rural roads that continue to see the stress of travel as more and more grain is transported for multiple purposes. There's also a need for major upkeep in our infrastructure on the Mississippi River. The locks and dam system that was built in the 1930s for the navigation of commercial barge traffic is an excellent example of innovation, but it's 80 years old. The system uh, needs upkeep and modernization, which is critical if U.S. farmers are going to be able to move their grain efficiently to be able to compete in the global marketplace. And while I'm using the Midwest U.S. as a case model, it's not the only area of commercial agriculture that's facing the challenges. In Brazil, for example, which is second only to the U.S. in soybean uh, exports and poultry exports, it's the largest exporter of sugar. Many of the highways that farmers rely on to move their grain aren't even paved. Poor roads impose high costs on farmers, particularly in the central and the west region of that country. And that's the area where the crops have the highest yields. The rail system is in poor physical condition after years of neglect, and even with modernization, it will likely remain an expensive and time-consuming uh, mode of transportation. So large investments in maintenance and infrastructure of uh, the transport infrastructure are needed in Brazil uh, to keep their production uh, up with the growing demand. The second area I'd mentioned is education. And when I say education, I, I say that across the board. The, you know, the U.S. has had an advantage in this area since the Morrill Act of 19, 1862 created the land-grant universities. We've educated generations of farmers, and public research provided new innovation that was complementary to that of industry. And today we have less and less funding for public research and support services. These are areas that are increasingly depending on the private sector. And this decrease in public support and information is a trend that needs to be reversed as both public and private uh, investment is vital. We're also faced with the need to cultivate the next generation of leaders and, uh, and innovative thinkers that are going to help us push productivity to the next level. Our seed business, Pioneer Hybrid, expects to bring more than 500 new jobs to Iowa in the next five years alone, many of them in research, but also in production and sales and, and uh, support services. But one question we face is, will we successfully find the talent? We will need agronomists, scientists, economists, communicators, uh, countless other professionals. And it isn't enough to just be trained in these areas. You need to really have a passion for agriculture. While you can't teach passion, you can instill it at an early age by making sure that students are exposed to these subjects early on in, in an environment that sparks their interest for further exploration and education. And as we think about the future of agriculture, we should ask ourselves, now, can we improve yield faster with innovation as an opportunity to better meet global demand? Is the development of more nutritious foods a way to add value to commodity crops uh, by addressing the needs of consumers? 
can we embrace environmental sustainability solutions as a way to do more with fewer natural resources? Of course, incre uh, with the goal of increasing uh, the efficiency of agriculture. Can we ensure that, that the food we produce in the world actually reaches the people who need it, both physically and financially? I believe the answer to each of those is yes. And the next question is, will success in that area offer additional opportunities to American growers? Yes, an emphatic yes, again. But there is, a, of course, a big if, or perhaps a series of ifs. We can meet global challenges of food, but only if we embrace the contributions from farmers everywhere, if we empower collaboration, if we ensure that farmers have the opportunity to choose the seeds and, and products uh, that work best for them, if we enhance the ability of farmers in all parts of the world to be as productive as they can be. Evidence of innovation and collaboration uh, are at work. I've talked with you about challenges of farmers in the developing world and about some of the challenges we face right here in Iowa. The challenges farmers face around the world aren't the same. There are developing nations that build, need to build state oversight, enforcement, strong markets, civil society, which we don't. Well, perhaps a bit more civility in Washington might be nice on occasion, but we have strong institutions here. On the other hand, we need to improve regulatory processes that may not even exist in some parts of the developing world. And the solutions need to be just as global as the challenge. So let me emphasize five principles for future success that are important around the globe to all farmers. First is intellectual property protection. Strong intellectual property protection spurs further innovation and collaboration. According to a new study released this year, the cost of developing a biotech product and bringing it to the market can be as high as 100 to 180 million dollars. And it, depending on the trade, it can take from 12 to 18 years from the time it's discovered till it actually reaches the marketplace. Investors need to have some confidence that they're going to receive some kind of return on that investment. The right incentives not only encourage single companies to invent, but they encourage companies to share the benefits of those inventions with others because with intellectual property rights, inventors are assured that they can work with others without the risk of losing the advantage, the legitimate advantage of their invention. There are many places where greater protection of intellectual property rights would <coughs> lead to greater productivity. As more innovation, uh, uh, enables more technologies to become available. This next chart helps it become obvious when you compare different countries and you take a look at, in this case, U.S. corn yields today. And you'll note that they far exceed those in developing Asia or Africa. Now there are many factors that play into this, as we've covered, but one area we can look at is intellectual property. We're far more confident investing in innovation when we know it's going to be protected. Think about India. Not too long ago, companies may have been wary about the Indian market. But today, because of the IP protection safeguards they put in place, India has become an important research hub for DuPont. Hyderabad, India is the location of one of our biotechnology knowledge centers where important work is being done to advance rice yields. So achieving success uh, in the midst of some of the most daunting challenges requires a mix of unprecedented uh, collaboration combined with open competitive markets that drive innovation. Open competitive markets mean that inventors can reach customers with new innovations. These markets require both domestic competition policies and, of course, uh, international emphasis on enabling trade. Similarly, the applicable regulatory uh, requirements would better foster innovation if they were speedier, if they were squarely based on science, if they were more harmonized across the globe. So. Farmers aren't caught between shifting uh, or discordant standards. There's one potential impediment, however, that deserves our attention now to ensure that important biotech traits in the commodity crops make an orderly transition uh, to a non-patented or a generic status. We're, we're nearing the patent expiry of the first major biotech trait in May of 2014. And others will follow fairly quickly after that. Unlike major, other major industries like pharmaceuticals and crop protection chemicals, we don't yet have a mechanism in place to ensure that ag biotechnology, uh, on a generic basis, uh, the competition can come to the market immediately after the patent expires. Or that the regulatory uh, information that's in place stays in place uh, as that trait becomes generic. Solving that problem will create big opportunities. 
It could revitalize university and private plant breeding efforts. It could create opportunities for seed companies to utilize generic versions of a biotech trade as components of new seed products to deliver higher value seeds to the market, both with output traits or with better protection against increasingly herbicide resistant weeds. In short, more competition will provide more choices for farmers. Collaboration works between research universities and seed companies. The important research done in universities can be invaluable in finding new approaches to seed technology and crop production management. One example is uh, a research uh, collaboration that began in uh, 2009 with Iowa State to develop a new technology to more effectively develop biotech traits in plants and particularly to improve drought tolerance in corn. We're also collaborating on a global scale. Last year, DuPont entered into a, an agreement with uh, the Indonesian Center for Rice Research to test and commercialize rice hybrids in Asia. We also have a partnership with the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines that brings together the Institute's rice germplasm pool with DuPont's capabilities in molecular analysis, commercial scale breeding, and field locations for testing the hybrids. And partnerships like these could contribute to making available to rice breeders and farmers throughout Asia uh, better and advanced breeding lines and new hybrids. Science-based regulation is also important. All farmers, large scale and small scale alike, have a need for sound, science-based regulatory approvals for new products and biotech traits. Whether you're a farmer in Iowa who needs to have a market open to sell your product, or a farmer in India who needs access to a new technology that would boost productivity and sustainability, global adoption of sound science-based regulatory systems is key. And when regulatory decisions are not based on science, the impact of innovation is limited. An example might be one of our products, uh, a biotech insect resistant maize or corn Herculex 1 insect protection trade is the trade involved. We've been waiting now almost 10 years for an approval to grow that product in Europe. Despite the fact that it's had three, it only requires one, but it's had three safety, uh, um, uh, uh, positive safety opinions from the European Food Safety Authority. And farmers in Europe are still denied the choice to use that product while in fact growers everywhere else are using the product and exporting those products back to Europe. In addition to science-based decisions, industry and governments need to work toward harmonization of regulatory approvals to make the process more efficient and more predictable. An example of why this might be important is Plenish. It's a, a high oleic soybean product that we've developed that has less saturated fat than commodity soy or palm oil, and it has the highest oleic content, the healthy oil profile that's available in soy. It's received regulatory approvals in the U.S., but we're still waiting approval from key import markets before the product can actually hit the market. It has both consumer and functional benefits, uh, but it can't come to market uh, commercially until we get all of those approvals. So there's a lot of work to be done in this area of harmonization. Some steps have begun. Uh, for example, Australia and New Zealand are demonstrating regional cooperation they, uh, between their authorities. These two countries now have um, uh, a single food standards agency that reviews submissions on behalf of both countries. Uh, the International Life Sciences Institute is a global organization with representation from public, private, and government researchers, and their position papers, uh, their research studies, their, and their recommendations related to food safety, risk assessment, and the environment carry uh, a great weight with global regulators. So, th you know, there are a number of positive examples of progress, but believe me, we still have a long, long distance to go. The fifth area I'd highlight is developing youth. Uh, while I was visiting Kenya last month, we had a discussion about the importance of youth development in Africa to prepare the next generation of farmers to help them address their food productivity gap. And when I think of time horizons, I think of 20 to 30 years. An important variable in Africa that I hadn't considered was that most of the generation has been lost to HIV AIDS. The youth in Africa today are going to need to take on the overall farming responsibilities in a few years. Urgency is key to help arm them with the information and the skills that they're going to need to succeed. And whether we're in the developing world or here in the developed area like the U.S., ensuring that we develop the next generation of leaders is critical. And we need leaders in agriculture specifically as well as uh, more broadly. Both my uh, involvement as a young person in my local 4-H club and today as the uh, chair of the National 4-H Council Board of Trustees,
Both of those things reinforce to me that 4-H is an organization that's having an increasingly impactful role fostering interest in agriculture, and building curiosity about science and developing skills and leadership through positive youth development. Programs that we all in the room know well are serving over six million young people here in the U.S. Recently a new program was launched uh, that's building connections overseas. The, uh, the Global 4-H Network is sponsored by DuPont along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Cargill and the Motorola Foundation and the Nike Foundation. And here in the U.S. beyond 4-H we're, we're involved with the Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture uh, in a project called My American Farm that brings ag-related learning to kids, families, uh, and classrooms through an online tool that targets uh, uh, math, science, social studies, uh, language, arts, health, all in the context of agriculture. The overall goal is to teach young people the connection between where their food is grown and where it's eaten in a platform that they're interested in and that they can relate to. Let me close by returning to the foundations of progress. At DuPont, we're a science company that believes in innovation and collaboration. We take seriously the example of the pioneer founder, Henry Wallace, who built his company by bringing innovation to the American cornfields. But we know that we can't invent everything ourselves. So we are also focused on finding ways to encourage innovation more broadly. For example, as I mentioned, the Green Revolution has largely not yet arrived to the traditional crops of Africa. That fact has sparked an effort to take biotechnology advances and connect them to so-called orphan crops, crops that are important to local people but may not offer the market potential to attract private investment. The uh, introduction of hybrid technology and the green revolution both required a change in the way we think or the way we thought. Innovation is, after all, an act of imagination and leadership, so we need to see the increases in local production everywhere as a necessity, not a threat to the developed world or to the established prices of, of commodity crops. We need to understand that leadership must be both local, as local as planting a seed, and as global as the shared demands that our growing population are, placing, are placing on the uh, on the planet. And for leaders in agriculture, innovation is an opportunity. And we see new opportunities every day in new science application and new technologies that have additional value to farmers. New ways of approaching the environment, the infrastructure, and support systems so farmers can use technologies more effectively. And as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, I certainly don't have all the answers to meeting this challenge, but I hope I've outlined some paths that can help us move forward. Many companies, uh, many governments, Many people have recognized the challenge and, and the need, and as I hope some of my examples have shown, many people around the world are hard at work to meet the challenge, to make sure that we rise to the looming uh, challenge that we have. It's our challenge, all of our challenge collectively, but this, to the students in the room, I think it's particularly your challenge. You know, a 22-year-old that graduates from Iowa State this spring will be 61 years old in the year 2050. That may seem like a long time to you. <clears throat> Doesn't seem so long to somebody who graduated from Iowa State over 30 years ago. And 61 actually isn't very old in agriculture. You know, it's not much older than the average age of the American farmer today. And in that year of 2050, you'll be among 9 billion residents on planet Earth. And the work that's happening today is shaping the world that you're going to live in. And more than anything else, we need people committed to this goal, people who are imaginative, who will lead, which is why I was so pleased to be able to come back to my alma mater and uh, to visit the next generation of farmers, of ag economists, of business people, and researchers. It's your work life that's going to be the time when this challenge will be met or when we fail. So what will it take for us to succeed? I'll share the words from an old DuPont publication. The quote is this, I'm cautiously optimistic, despite all of today's gloom and doom that we will live <clears throat> a longer and better life than all previous generations. But solutions to problems can be synthesized and implemented only by well-informed, clear-thinking minds with positive points of view. You can't hope to win the game of life with negativism. It was said in 1982 by Dr. Norman Borlaug. <clears throat> Dr. Borlaug, as you may know, spent three years at the DuPont Experiment Station early in uh, the 1940s when he began his career. And then he went off to start the Green Revolution, and thank goodness he did. I met and uh, 
had the chance to work with Dr. Borlaug on a project later, nearly uh, nearer the end of his life. We were exploring new technologies. You know, uh, in this case, it was information technology, and how it might be used to educate more people about agriculture. New technology can be daunting to uh, to some older people, but Norm loved learning new things, and he never stopped thinking about how to improve the world. And he knew the formula: better innovation more collaboration to improve agriculture, to empower farmers to feed the world. That was his formula. It's our formula at DuPont, and now it can be your formula. I think of agriculture as the optimistic science. And when I see the students in this room, the reason for optimism is quite clear. Because with innovation and collaboration, you can help us do what the world needs us to get done. Thank you. I'd be happy to entertain questions for a few minutes if anybody has one. Questions? We have a microphone There's at a... the back. Or... Well, Jim, I'll take the first question. Oh, do we? Ha did I see a hand over here? Mark, okay. Good question. Uh, primarily as a business leader, but in, you have to understand that inside our company, we're a science company. So science is kind of at the heart of everything we do. Uh, but, uh, but we also recognize that science for science sake doesn't really make a difference. It's got to be something that customers value, turning it into something that will help a customer, a farmer in our case, be successful. And so that's business. So I, I guess I would say I'm thought of as a business leader, but kind of can't uh, can't get very far away from the, the core of science. Jim, my question would be, uh, what advice would you give to the students in the room today in terms of how they think about uh, developing their plan for the future so that they too can be a part of solving this uh, global opportunity that we all have to feed the world? Two things. Two things, Wendy. I think, first of all, where you ended, and that is, and, and, and to follow Norm Borlaug's uh, uh, comment, see it as an opportunity. It is a challenge, and if it doesn't work out, it's a real problem, but we can't focus on that. What we have to focus on is the opportunity, and the opportunity is great, and it's a, it's a business opportunity, and it's a, a social opportunity. So that's number one, is, is keep the right mindset. Uh, number, number two is uh, whatever your field of study is, whether you're in one of the sciences uh, or whether you're studying business or something you know, more broad, understand both. Sometimes we define it kind of as the T. You know, make sure you're deep in something, but make sure you're broad. Make sure you, you have a, a, a global view. Uh, agriculture has got to be one of the most global industries, and yet at the same time it's the most local, uh, literally down to the field. But we are so intertwined now as a globe, and agriculture is such a a common thread through some of the issues that we are having and that we will have. Um, I think it's really important for students to, to develop a global view, whether that's through travel, through uh, work experiences, through study abroad, through just through curiosity. But uh, those are the two things I'd suggest. Another question? I think we have one here. In the future, if the oil prices increase dramatically, what tend to where it increases the food price and what technology may be needed for this challenge? That's a great question. Is everybody able to hear the questions? question was if oil prices go uh, significantly higher, what, what technology will be needed and what's the impact on food prices? The, first of all, um, as oil prices continue to go up, uh, as they go up a little bit, it actually uh, you know, helps farm incomes because crop prices tend to slip up with it. But if things go too high, immediately or eventually what you see happen fertilizer prices go up input you know so inputs for farmers go up so it's not always a big help to farm incomes food prices go up costs other costs for consumers also go up uh, and and so it oil prices that are too high are a significant issue uh, over the long term which is one of the reasons why 
the, the low stocks to use ratio is, is a real issue for us right now because we've got other reasons that are driving commodity prices up, but we also don't have any shock absorber in the system. So a little bit of a, a, a weather problem or a supply problem somewhere uh, can create some short-term but significant price spikes. And, you know, if, if food prices uh, double for us, it's still a relatively small percentage of our income. If they double for people in many parts of the world, it's uh, the difference between eating and not eating. Uh, so technologies that are needed, uh, we need to work on everything. So one is getting the technologies that exist deployed. Uh, we, I talked about the example in Africa, and, and of course the, we're not going to feed the world just through smallholder farmers, but there is an issue there. There's technology that if it gets deployed and people are, are, have the help to use it, we can significantly increase yields and therefore keep commodity prices at a, at a more reasonable level. But the other one that we're working on, which is going to take more time, are things like nutrient use efficiency and drought resistance. So let's take nutrient use efficiency. We've got some, um, some things in the pipeline that uh, early leads are indicating that we can get a significant reduction in nitrogen use uh, or application of nitrogen and still get the same yields. The farmer in me said, what happens if I put on the same nitrogen? And of course the answer is you get a lot more yield. So, but, but you know, if we can continue to learn how to modify the plant's processes so it can make better use of the nitrogen, yeah, you know, let's put it on the field and have it go in the plant, not over to the to the creek or down down the river. So, it's all of those. It, that's one example. It's all of those things. How do we help the plants be able to use things more efficiently and more effectively? And uh, you know, biotechnology is a huge help to that. Not just the traits, but the the capability that's uh, that that's that's coming by understanding the genome better and understanding how the plants work. So, uh, you know, this. Rather than listing a specific technology like nitrogen use or nutrient nutrient use, I would just say application of that technology uh, to, to as many crops as, as we can, as rapidly as we can. Over here, there's two. We'll take the back one for uh, take the front. Uh, certainly, as you look at uh, the conversion of uh, corn into ethanol for transportation fuel, you see the beginning of a larger trend of the conversion of food products into technological products. Certainly DuPont's well placed to be a player in this game. Do you see this conversion of food into chemicals, if you will, as a good thing or a bad thing, and in what ways? It's, um, first of all, the, 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 the grain-based ethanol is, is here. It's an important um, uh, learning lab or stepping stone, whatever you want to say. It's an important step along the way. What we're focused on as a company is second generation biofuels that won't be using uh, directly food uh, products. So cellulosic ethanol, um, things from switchgrass, corn stover, uh, et cetera. So the, the longer term direction is how do we create uh, biofuels from things that aren't directly coming out of food. Uh, but I, but I, don't, I do want to emphasize that having an installed base of ethanol is very helpful to help accelerate those other processes. Um, the, uh, uh, in terms of materials, uh, right, we're operating the largest biorefinery in the world making uh, uh, renewable materials. Uh, we, have to be, we have to continue to move that technology so that it's not significant uh, competition for food. But actually, if you look at U.S. corn exports, despite the ethanol, we've continued to increase exports, I think, every year. I, I haven't checked the last year or two. but. So I think that we can produce biofuels and biomaterials in the way we are today and produce the food we need in the world uh, in sustainable ways, but, uh, but we do need to take the pressure off of that. If we keep increasing biofuels from, from food-based, that's going to be a problem. But they're expected to flatline by 2015, and, uh, and, and we'll be moving to second-generation fuels. So I don't see it as a significant issue in the long term as long as we're moving to those next generations. There was a question right behind, and then over here. Mr. Burrell, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak this evening. My question is, um, outside of the agriculture industry, we've seen a lot of companies try to enter into developing nations by simply taking an existing technology or product and try to commoditize it. Understanding that we're trying to develop technologies and, and, and new products that both fit into a 21st century farming practice here in the United States and other developed countries, as well as a 1950s or, or even earlier equivalent type of farming practice in developing countries. How do you and your company go about addressing both of those needs? Yeah. 
the first thing I'd say is we start with the farmer and what is the, what, what's, the, what's the farmer need and where, where are they going? So, you know, in, in Iowa, it's corn with, I'm not sure I can count how many traits are, are stacked in. In China, we're selling hybrid corn, advanced hybrids, great yielding hybrids. But really, to be honest, the most significant thing we've done, other than introduce a, a couple of great hybrids, is help farmers figure out how to use them. Uh, figure out that because we can produce good quality seed, they don't need to put four uh, uh, kernels in a hill and then thin it out later. They can put one and it'll grow. Uh, it's uh, in Ethiopia helping farmers learn to use hybrid seed uh, rather than open pollinated, where they can uh, double or triple their yields oftentimes because it's not just the seed, it's it's the agronomy that goes with it. So how do you help them not only have better products, but have the, the information that can help them get the most from those products? So the philosophy is the same around the world. Um, and the products are kind of what's the next step of technology that will help that farmer go to the next level. Um, oftentimes, uh, I, I, you know, we talk about bio biotechnology is hugely important. But, but biotechnology traits are not a silver bullet everywhere in the world. What, we, what we've got to do is start with what the farmer needs help them move to the next level. And what we find is that helps them be successful. Then they're ready to take on more technology and more advancements. And so that, that, I hope that answers your question about our approach. There's one in the middle here. Uh, she'll be around with the microphone in just a second. Thank you. Uh, my question is, in the past, as you mentioned in the lecture, the price of the commodities have gone up. For us in here, paying a little more does not kill us. But those who are just at the break-even point in the third world, these people have a hard time paying for it. Now, a great deal of what we pay for something is based on the cost of production. And then on top of that, there is a little bit of, I don't know exactly how much, speculation that enters the price. How much of price increases is to due to uh, speculation? And a lot of people are jumping the bandwagon too by increasing their prices. I buy uh, honey from a local farmer because a physician told me it contains pollen of the local allergens that if you, if you eat it all year round, you develop immunity. The price of honey has gone up roughly for me 50%. I asked the farmer what happened to the price of the thing. He says the price of a gas has gone up. I asked, are your bees using more gas going between <laughs> the flowers and the honeybee? We laughed about it, and that was the end of it. Well, uh, you, you, you've alluded to one interesting thing that kind of happens, like maybe a little bit as human nature, where sometimes things do leak in from the, the side that aren't necessarily economically justified. But to, to, to your original question around um, speculators, I, now you're going to take me back to 30-plus uh, years to my ag econ marketing uh, courses, and I'm, I'm looking around. I, Paul Doak's not in the room, I hope. But uh, the, uh, my, my view, a little simplistic, is that uh, Speculators can, uh, can affect a price in the short term if a bunch of them flood in or leave. Uh, but at the end of the day, a, t a market clears. Somebody's got to be a buyer. Somebody's got to be a seller. Contracts get delivered. And uh, speculators get in a little bit of trouble if they, if they hang around too long. So I, I think that in the, in the longer term or over a period of time, uh, I, I'm not convinced that speculation is the primary driver of food prices. And, and whether it is or it isn't, the key thing, at least for folks like, like us in, in DuPont, the thing we can impact is how do we help farmers produce more? And if we produce more and we can stay up with the increasing demand, the demand supply is more of a fundamental driver for, uh, for, uh, for, for price, the fundamentals around pricing. And, and that's the equation I think we ought to focus on. Mr. Burrell, I'm Dr. Shah from uh, Des Moines University in Des Moines. And my question and concern is regarding uh, maternal and infant health uh, in developing countries, especially iron deficiency anemia is a huge problem, as you probably know. Um, almost 2 billion people are affected. So how has agriculture productivity and technology helped to change or address that issue? Um, 
in particular iron deficiency, uh, very little yet. But, uh, but if we talk in general, uh, there's some pretty exciting work going on around biofortifying crops. Um, you know, we've got a, a, a joint project uh, around biofortifying sorghum uh, for Africa to, to get, so how do we get more nutrients built into what is an indigenous crop and, and a normal part of people's diets? And I think with, with the use of, of some of the modern tools, we're going to be able to do that more effectively and, and more rapidly than we could even five or six years ago. Uh, that said, uh, I mentioned briefly orphan crops. It, it isn't easy uh, to invest, I mean, even though we can do it faster and, 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 and easier, it's not free. It, it takes investment, it takes scientists to be working on it. And the challenge, of course, is a lot of these crops are small acres. There's not much of an opportunity to, to have any kind of a return. And, and uh, you know, we do a lot of philanthropy, but unfortunately our shareholders expect us to earn a return as well. So, so we're always looking for creative partnerships where for a crop that maybe is not something that we can make a commercial go of, um, is there a partnership we can have? So, for example, we've got a couple of, uh, I mentioned the uh, biofortified sorghum that uh, Howard Buffett is, is working with us on, as well as a couple local organizations. We've got a joint project with uh, CIMID and the Gates Foundation uh, in Africa. So what we're doing is we're looking for innovative uh, collaborations where somebody else can help us with some of the support and the money to get the pump prime, because we're, we're really kind of giving them the technology and the capability in order to, to, to make it help. We need, we need everybody who's got this kind of capacity working on that and working hard on it. How do we find the creative ways to get the changes made? Um, but the challenge is always, how do you make enough change fast enough? Thank you for joining us tonight. Please uh, step over and have a refreshment with us and uh, continue the conversation uh, with the audience. Thank you.